shade between the leaves as the Halloween tree puzzled. Several days had passed since his last visit to Mint House, and he had calculated that it was time for another thrilling day. But there was no sign of Mint at his room, nor any wet clay on the wheel. George's shop was a tidy with few chickens in the yard, the only sound of work. Emboldened by silence, Cheat emerged from his hiding place and approached the house. Against the wall was a set of shelves holding a few of Mill's last creations. They were at the stage the pot is called Leather Hard. Dried by the air, but not yet glazed or fired. I'm glazed to work with a little interest of these. The finished pieces were surely locked up somewhere in the house. Tree Eater paused at the edge of the brush and listened hardly a moment. A hen clucked proudly, and Tree Ear grinned. The man would have an egg for his supper, but there was no, still no signs of the potter. So Tree Ear took to, to the last few steps of the stand before the shelf. For the last time, he was seeing men's work at close range. There was a duck that would have fit in the palm of his hand with a tiny hole in its bill. Tree Ear had seen such a duck before, in use before. A painter had been sitting on, a, on the river bank working on a water scene. The painter had poured water from a dip, duck's bill onto a stone and a single drop at a time. Mixing ink to exactly the correct points of the same thing for a circle. Tree Ear stared at Mint's duck. Though it was now a dull gray, so detailed were its features that he found himself half listening for the sound of a quack. Mint had shaped and then carved the clay to form a wing and tail of tail. Even the little tail curled up with an impudence that made Tree Ear smile. He tore his gaze away from the duck to examine the next piece, a tall jug with rivered lines that imitated the shape of a horn. The lines were so perfectly symmetrical, curving up so, so gracefully from top to bottom that Peter longed to run his fingers along the smooth, shallow grooves. The non salmon leaves were a cleverly shaped to form the lid of the jug. The last piece on the shelf was the least interesting. A rectangular littered box as large as his two feet. It was completely undecorated. Disappointed in its plainness, Tree Ear was ready to turn away when a thought struck him. Outside the box is torn, but perhaps inside. Holding his breath, he reached out, gently lifted the lid, and looked inside. He grinned in the double delight as his only correct guess and at mint skill. The cleaning box held five smaller boxes. A small round one in the center and four curved boxes that fit perfect, uh, around it perfectly. The small boxes appeared to completely fill the larger container, but Mint had left exactly the right amount of space to allow any of them to be lifted out. Tree Ear put the lid of the large box down on the shelf and picked up one of the curved containers. On the underside of the, its lid was a lip of a clay that held the lid in place. Tree Ear's eyes flickered back and forth between the small pieces in his hand and the larger container. His brow furrowed in thought. How did men fit them together so perfectly? Perhaps he made the large box and a second one to fit inside and cut the smaller box from that? Or did he make an inside box first and fit the larger box around it? Maybe he began with the small central box and curved ones. Then someone shouted. The chicken squawked nervously and the tree ear dropped what he was holding. He stood there paralyzed for a moment and threw his hands up in front of his face to protect himself from the blows that were down on his head and shoulders. It was the old potter. Thief! He screamed. How dare you come here? How dare you touch my work? Tree Ear did the only thing he could think of. He dropped to his knees and covered in a deep, formal bow. Please, please, Honor Lucia, I was not stealing your work. I came only to admire it. Min King halted in mid low. The potter stood over the board with the cane still closed for another shake. 
Have you been here before, better boy? Treat your thoughts for more pleasure than it's, the truth seemed the easiest. Yes, honorable sir, I come often to watch your work. Ah! Priyu still doubled over in his bow, but out of the corner of his eye, he could see the tip of the cane as it was lowered to the ground. He allowed himself a single sigh of relief. So it is you who breaks the twigs and bruises the leaves of the bowing tree just beyond. Priyu nodded, feeling his flush face, face flush. He had thought he was cowering his tracks well. Not to see all you say. How do I know you do not watch just to see when I have made something of extra value? Now, Tree Ear raised his head and looked at me. He kept his voice respectful, but he was worried to proud. I would not steal. Stealing and begging make a man be no better than a dog. The potter stared at Ford for a long moment. At last, Min seemed to make up his mind about something, and when he spoke again, his voice had lost, lost the sharpest edge of its English. So you were not stealing? It is the same thing to me. With one part damaged, the rest is of no use. He gestured at the mishap and potty rocks on the ground, badly dented from its fall. Get on your way, then. I know better than to ask for payment for what you have ruined. Peter stood slowly, the sh shame hot in his breast. It was true. He could never hope to pay Min for the damaged block. Min picked it up and tossed it on the rubbish heap at the side of the yard. He continued to mutter crossly. Hi, three days of work and for what? For nothing. I am behind now. The order will be late. Junior had taken a few dragon steps out of the yard, but on hearing the old potter's mutterings, he lifted his head and turned towards Honorable Potter, sir. Could I not work for you as payment? Perhaps my help could save you some time? Min shook his head impatiently. What could you do with a trained child? I have no time to teach you. You would be more trouble than help. Three ears stepped forward eagerly. You would not need to teach me as much as you think. I have been watching you for many months now. I, ha I know how you mix the plate and turn the wheel. Watched you make many things. The potter waved one hand and cut the boys with it, spoke with derision. Turn the wheel? Ha! He thinks he can just sit there and make a pot just like that. Tree Ear crossed his arms stubbornly and did not look away. Min picked the rest of his box and set it and tossed it too on the rubbish heap. He muttered in his breath so Tree Ear could not hear the words. Min straightened up and glanced at the shelf, then at the wheel, and finally to a tree ear. Yes, all right, he said, his voice still rough with an annoyance. Come tomorrow at daybreak, then. Three days it took me to make that pot, so you will give me nine days' work in return. I could not even begin to think how much greater the value of my work is than yours, but we will set it on this for a start. Tree ear bowed in agreement. He walked around the side of the house, then flew off down the road. He could hardly wait to tell Crane Man for the first time in his life he would have real work to do. Upon arriving the next day for work, Tree ear learned that it was Min's chop turn to chop wood for the kiln fires. That was why he had not been at home that day before. Like most of the potters others, Chaofo had a communal camp, Kellen, set on the hillside just outside the center of the village. It looked like a long, low tunnel made of hardened clay. The potters took turns using the kiln and picking up the supply of fuel. Men handed Tree Ear a small axe and went around the side of the house to a wheel, wheeled cart. Fill the cart with wood, men barked. Dry wood, not wet. Do not come back until the cart is full. Tree Ear felt as though the sun had suddenly dimmed. The night before, sleep had not come easily. He had imagined himself at the wheel, a beautiful pot glowing from the clay before him. Perhaps he would thought now, if he chopped enough wood quickly, there would still be time at the end of the day. Min squashed the hole. It was his next year. Take care to go well in the mountains. Far too many trees have been cut too close to the village. You will walk a long way before you find a plentiful stand of trees. 
Treatise swallowed a sigh as he placed the axe in the cart. Grasping the, the two angels, he wheeled the cart onto the road. He turned to wave farewell, but the potter was no longer there. The sound of the throne song floated out from behind the house. Chopping wood for hours with a single bite to eat had been hard enough, but the worst of that day was the long trip back down to the mountainside with a cart, cart full of wood. The path was red and bumpy. The homemade cart was poorly balanced, awkwardly, awkward with his heavy load. At every step, Trier had to keep it, his eye trained on the path and the cart. In spite of his efforts, whenever the wheel took a deep breath, the cart took precautiously, and some of the logs fell down. Then he had to stop and pick up the fallen wood. It was more than annoying because he had been careful to lay the wood neatly as he chopped, and each bump led to further disarray of the tidy path. After this had happened more than times than he could tell, Tree Ear neared the end of the mountain path. Soon it would whiten and smooth out into more heavily traveled foothills roads. Tree Ears lifted his head for a moment in eager anticipation of the end of the day. Just then the right hand wheel caught a stone. The cart handles were wrenched from his hands and the cart tipped on onto the side. Momentum, momentum pulled Tree Ear off balance and he tripped over the cart and tumbled head first into the ground. He sat up dazed. For a moment he didn't know whether to curse or cry. He set his lips together tightly and scrambled to his feet, then pulled the cart upright and began bringing the wood back into it into a frenzy. As he heaved a large rough log on a, an arrow of pain shot through his right hand. He cried out and clenched it, a fist for a moment until the throbbing eased a little. Then he opened it cautiously and examined the injury. The pillow of fluid that had formed on his hand after long hours of wielding the axe had burst. Blood ran from the wound, mixing with dirt and small bits of bark. Two ears stared at it and he could not stop the tears that had pressed hot behind him his eyes. Angrily, he bowed, blinked away the tears, and set about tearing a strip of cloth from the bottom of the tunic. There was no water nearby, so he spat on his palm and wiped it as best as he could, plunging his teeth against the pain. He used his other hand and his teeth to wrap and tie the cloth into a makeshift band-aid. From then on, he worked slowly and methodically, stacking the wood in neat rows in the cart. The sun was low in the sky when he finished it last and wheeled the cart cautiously down the path to the foothills road. Tree Ear dragged himself home to the bridge that evening. Cranman's normally placed at expression was the place with a frown of worry when Tree Ears stumbled into the space under the stairs and collapsed into a heap on the ground. Cranman said nothing. He merely held out a bowl in which he had placed a small mound of rice and a little pile of boiled greens. Six stuff to eat, Tree Ear waved the food away, but Crane Man hobbled to his side and used his crutch for support as he eased himself down to sit next to Tree Ear. Crane Man picked up a little rice in his fingers and insist insistently, but still without a word, began feeding Tree Ear as if he was a baby. Tree Ear did not remember finishing the meal, but he awoke the next morning to see Crane Man swing himself down the ridge by holding one of the stirs and he always did. Small and slight, and who knew how old Green Man still moved his upper body with the ease of young man. Many were the times the times that Tree Ears forgot completely about Babe's leg. Where had Green Man been so early? Tree Ears sat up stiffly and began to rub his eyes. As brought his as he brought his hand right hand up to his face he caught sight of the crude bandage it was stiff with dry blood yes this is what i have been about said green man now let us see what we can see junior held out his hand green man untied the bandage and began to unwrap it junior his sharply in pain and snatched his hand away final layer of cloth clung stubbornly to the wound, and Crane Man had been trying to pull it off. Come now, my monkey friend, said Crane Man, kindly but firmly. It must be removed so that we can clean the wound. 
The demons of sickness I no doubt already scheming to enter your body through such a door. Treat your rose and shuffle to the water's edge. He crouched and dipped his hand in the water. His coolness soothed the throb and its wetness loosened the cloth grip on the wound. Wincing his eased the band-aid away. While Treat Ear clenched his set wound, Crane Man took the strip of cloth and washed it thoroughly with water from the gourd bowl scrubbing it against a flat stone at the river's edge. Then he wrung it out and handed it to Treeer, who scrambled up the bank and hung it on the strip to dry in the sun. From his waist pile, Crane Man took a handful of green herbs he had gathered in the woods earlier in the morning. He scooped them to a paste between two stones, then scooped up some of the paste with his two fingers and applied it to Treeer's hands. Close your hands! Close your hand, Crane Man ordered. Squeeze so the healing juices may enter the wound. The two friends ate the last of the rice treasure for breakfast. Treer holding the paste as he ate with his other hand. Then Crayman tied the now dry strip of cloth back into a bandage. There, he said, a few days rest will see that hand is fit as new. He looked at Treer sternly. Treer said nothing. He knew that Crayman had already guessed there would be no rest that day. There was still eight days of work be, to be done for him. That's it for today. Bye!